those three areas are the three areas that trip up most people in society, anywhere from a political situation, a family situation, a church situation, a geopolitical situation. It's usually dealing with money, sex, and power. You can see what's happening right now with Vladimir Putin and what he's trying to do and trying to, you know, trying to take land. And, and we see what's going on with China. A lot of it's a power grab. You see what's going on with a lot of situations in people's marriages and politics and churches, the situation with um, sex. And by the way, that we're starting that section next week on sex. It will be PG-13, but we'll, do, we'll be very careful to be respectful. But if you have children under the age of 12 or so, maybe, if you want to, we're going to avail you an opportunity to um, go to children's church or also we'll have something for parents that don't feel comfortable. Uh, I, I do want to encourage you that if, you are, or if your kids are around, they're 12 years old, uh, I will be respectful for that as well. I think it's important that the church understands that God designed these things. Money and sex and power are from God. He made those things. It was not the enemy's idea. And it's important that we have to understand the proper relationship to these things because they're blessings from God, and that's what God's made. The enemy comes and distorts it. And there's constantly the children and our society, you and I, are constantly be, are fed lies day in. Day out. If you're watching a sports game, it's in, innocuous. All of a sudden, a commercial comes on, and it's, it's broadcasting to you something that's completely contrary to God. Billboards, advertisements, jokes, music, everything is screaming exact opposite of what God would have for us. And we have to be intentional to talk about it. We can't run away from these things because the world is broadcasting it. The enemy is broadcasting it. It's such an important part of our society, and, and God wasn't blushing. God made it, and so we want to make sure that we have a proper relationship with, with uh, understanding of sex. And so it's important to talk about these things. So we'll talk about it next week. We're going to look into what the Bible has to say about it, what's a proper relationship, and how we can utilize that and, and get ourselves torqued in the right direction in these areas. Then we'll talk about power. And so, you know, those three things, money, sex, and power. As I said before, I was in seminary. They said gold, the glory, and the girls. Those are the three things that will get you. Watch out for those things. And so it's important that we're pre, uh, preactive, or proactive, excuse me. It's, it's important that we make a decision what we're going to do prior to entering situations of temptation with money and these various things. It's important to have a plan. You know, first responders, firemen, uh, sports teams, they practice. They know what's going to happen. If, if something takes place, they know what they're supposed to do. And we can't be flat-footed in this. We have to be preparing ourselves how to handle these situations in society, and that's what's continued. Today, we're closing out our section on money, and we're going to have a little bit of continuation we talked about uh, last week about the God of Mammoth. Let me just quickly re uh, review what happened. The first week, we talked about investing in eternity. Remember, I talked about the rope and, and how... Um, and how we often live for this little red piece, and yet God, eternity is over here, and we should invest our lives, and it will last forever, and what's not temporary, that's the most important thing, that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. If your treasure is in eternity with God, then that's where your heart's going to be, and you're going to navigate and make the proper decisions in life. Last week, we spoke about the God of mammon, and how this God of mammon, that money is not immaterial, money has a spirit on it. I mentioned to you the fact is, literally speaking, money is neutral, but practically speaking, money is not neutral. Anytime you touch money, there's a spirit on it. Because why? Because people are involved with it. And the God of mammon we spoke about is the God of I want more. Unrighteous mammon, I want control. Make no mistake, our country is living in the God of mammon. There's no, there's no doubt about it. All you have to do is see what's taking place and how we're living our country is living and how we're living and how we're being influenced by our culture. You have to understand something else as well, that when you are in an environment, you're affected by your environment, even if you're not participating in the environment. I had an experience uh, back in 1993. I went to Guatemala City, and at the time, it was a lot of pollution there, and so much pollution that my clothes got soot all over it. There was soot in my eyes, and, my, and, and every area of my body had soot. And it was, I was coughing, it was soot. And I wasn't like producing the diesel fuel. I wasn't driving any vehicle, but just being in that environment affected me. Being in this environment of our America, as wonderful as it is, the God of mammon gets all over us. And if we're not aware of it, we get sucked into the mentality of it. And we, religion, we make it religious, and the next thing you know, we're serving the God of mammon, which we're going to define a little bit more. So money has a spirit on it. Money's not neutral, and so you have to take, you have to, today is about seizing the God of mammon. Today, seizing your money and making it obedient for God. 
So let's go ahead and go back to um, Luke chapter 16. And we're going to go ahead and talk about that in a few moments. It's really interesting. I was, I was in preparing for this past week, last couple of weeks, I was reading about lottery. Are you familiar with what lottery is? <laughs> Everywhere you go, people are scratch and sniff games, whatever you want to call them. People are scratching. And I was a kid. I used to scratch the sticker and smell it if you behaved. Remember that? Well, now they have these scratch games, and no matter where you go, Powerball and all that, it's become really, real popular. No matter where you go, you see it. And sometimes I'm in a grocery line, I'm buying something, and I'll see a person with kind of ragged clothes, and you can tell they're struggling, and they're buying these things. Like, what's going on? And I was reading about it and trying to figure out why. It seems like gambling and, and lotteries are just exploding all around our society, and people are saying it's a way to pay taxes and a way to help people make money and all this and the other. But I was reading, and... Uh, I was reading, according to a CNN article, which I don't know if I always trust CNN, but nevertheless, read an article online. And as of January 2014, more than half of us have played lottery in the past year. More than half of a population of America has played lottery in the last year. However, 20% of customers buy the majority of tickets. In the fiscal year, listen to this, in the fiscal year of 2012, America spent 78 billion dollars playing lottery and since 1964 new hampshire was the first place to have it live free or die okay they're the first folks to have it and what drives the popularity of lottery tickets is not the incredible odds the odds are insane i'm just going to read you some of the, the odds here they're winning the lottery you're more likely to be a, be attacked by a shark <laughs> <laughs> one in 11.5 million chance you have. Or die in a lightning strike, one in three million, then you have to win Powerball. The grand prize is one in 175 million chance. One in 175 million. Listen to this. I was reading it. You have to buy, listen to this, they have a 50-50 chance of winning the, the uh, Powerball, you have to buy 86 million tickets to reach even a 50-50 chance of winning. Although the chances of winning Powerball is less than having a meteor crash into a house. One in 182 trillion chance. I mean, what, I mean, it's just foolish. You can't win, but people do it. Why? Because they are dreaming of having this money. We like to fantasize for two minutes, and I, I was reading about some of the commentators and what they had to say about, and uh, Rebecca Paul um, Hargrove, president of Tennessee Education of Lolly Corporation, puts it this way, for $2, you can spend the day dreaming about what you would do with a half a billion dollars, and, and like, like what Adam Pryor said, he said this, a game where there's no reason and no logic are rendered obsolete, and hopes and dreams are on sale. I, I had the opportunity to go away and pray for a couple of days. I, I went up to uh, Newport, and I uh, did the cliff walk, you know. And they had these mansions, these, like, huge mansions with Vanderbilts and all that, and just extraordinary. I mean, it cost a billion dollars probably to build them today. And I'm walking through there, and I'm looking at these other houses and people driving these nice, you know, big houses with the huge hedges and all. I'm thinking, man, I wonder what it would be like to be a billionaire. I wonder what it would be like. And I started, I started smiling, started feeling really good. Like, man, that'd be nice. Like, could do what I wanted to do, and, you know, I did, just wouldn't have to work at all. Just, I would just do everything out of the goodness of my heart. I could write checks so my kids could, I could have an endowment for my kids for the six generations. I could pay off the, pay off the church and pay off this and walk around. Everyone would love me. I could drive what I want. I could buy cooler clothes and these old-fashioned garbs. I could do all this cool stuff and, and all that. I could wear alligator shoes. All right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding about that. But I, I kind of felt good about it. I said, wait a minute here. Why is that that me thinking about having all that money makes me happy? Why? Because what, what, is, what would that give me if I had that kind of money? If any of you win Powerball, you need to hand it over to me. But anyhow, <laughs> or, have him, or give me the meteorite that went through your house. <laughs> but it made me feel good because why because i had control when i thought about that ah oh, all my problems would go away it almost gave me a sense of peace almost a religious quote unquote experience if i had this money then i would be happy you know yeah and, and that's a lie that the culture tells us all the time 
And so why do we think that, and how do we handle this situation? How do we handle this God of mammon? And Jesus talks about it, and we, we're going to go back a little bit to the parable and kind of unpack a little bit more what the God of mammon and how to seize the God of mammon and make it obedient to God in our lives. Uh, we spoke last week, Jesus talked about the God of mammon. He talked about a, a steward of a master. His job was to collect the taxes or revenue or rent, whatever you want to call it, from his constituents. And what happened was this steward was doing a bad job. He's going to fire him. So what he basically said, I'll give you, he went to everyone else. If you owed him 100 bucks, he said, pay me 50, and I'll tell it's okay. And so the, the, the owner of the steward would say, hey, that's pretty shrewd. So Jesus gives a principle here. I want to talk a little bit more about it. And this is what he has to say in Luke uh, 16, starting at verse 8. It says, so the master commended the unjust steward because he dealt shrewdly for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. In other words, what he's basically saying is the world is really shrewd utilizing money to get what they want, aren't they? Think about it. I mean, isn't it amazing? It is amazing to me that money is just not economic. Money represents how we view people. So let's be honest, if you're, if you're at a party or something, or you're at a barbecue and uh, some guy invites some guy over and he's, or he or she has a lot of money, the person comes in with the crown jewels of England on, and you know, they drive with a, a Maserati, keeps using Maseratis, I don't know why, but this is a Bentley, whatever it is, they walk in, you're like, wow. Or you're sitting in a restaurant and someone walks in, or you're walking around Newport, or wherever you're at, and you see all these wealthy people, you're like, man, wouldn't that be nice? And sometimes you feel like you're a little less than they are if you're not careful. Or you find someone else that may be struggling, and you're like, it, 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 makes me, uh, it makes me kind of sad because, you know, I like baseball, and I used to grow up, I used to go to Yankee Stadium in the Bronx before they redid the stadium. And in the Yankee Stadium, everyone went through the same gate. If you went to the snack bar, everyone went to the same snack bar. And so you had masses, a collection of people that were very wealthy, people that are, uh, not, are poor, people that were medium income. We all enjoyed the game together. Of course, there were expensive seats, but you still kind of intermix. I used to, I used to go from the top section to the bottom section. It was empty. <laughs> now you go to Yankee Stadium, and they have separate entrances based upon class. They do. They really do. If you can pay the, the uh, lazy boy chairs, those big blue chairs, if you've ever watched the games, they're like $1,000, $2,000. It's insane. You have a separate gate you go into, and you can't even, I can't even get over there. There's a fence, and they have to check you. They have quarantined different areas. And that's, that's like a class system. Have you noticed that in our society today, there's like a class system going on here? And we tend to look people that have less money as less important. And if you have money, you must be smart. If you don't have money, you must be dumb and lazy. And, and there seems to be this character, characterization of different people, isn't there? Seem to be that way. And so we often value people upon money. And it's an easy thing to do. And of course, there's some truth and, and, and false things in all those statements. But look what Jesus has to say. We'll continue to read what he has to say and unpack it some more. He says in verse 9, And I say to you, make friends by yourself, by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. We mentioned last year, last, year, <laughs> last week, that that was part of if you handle finances well, you're going to have a better time in heaven. But at the same time, what he's saying here is what? He's saying, and I say, make friends by yourself, unrighteous mammon. Let's continue to read and see the context. As There's multiple contexts here, but let's continue to read. That when you fail, they may receive you into the everlasting home. Verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to trust true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so I want to talk about seizing mammon and making it your control. You see, the world knows how to take mammon and manipulate it to get what they want. It's, to me, it's a little insane that to run for president these days. You had to spend a billion dollars. The last political campaign, each candidate spent about a billion a billion. Dollars. Isn't that insane? How much money it costs? You almost have to buy elections these days. If you get the money. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really shameful what has to happen. Our politicians have to spend so much time raising money they can't even run the government. I, I, I had no comment about that, but I... <laughs> 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 and that happens on both sides. 
But seriously, there's such an incredible stress to raise money that is screwing up our government. And it's so interesting, there's been some social experiments that have been failing. So let's just get rid of money altogether. You know, communism, uh, if you ever go to Cuba, which I have not been to, or, uh, or of the former Soviet Union, it does not work. You've read Animal Farm. It does not work. Communism does not work. Where you live a cashless society, it works good in Star Trek, but it doesn't work in the real life. You guys don't watch Star Trek. Okay, that's all right. We'll, we'll get over that. And so Jesus says the sons of this world are more shrewd. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed, the Bible says, take every thought captive, right, and make it obedient to Christ. Having an understanding of, serving the God of mammon is not only an attitude, it is a mindset. So what we have to do is take captive mammon and take it captive and make it serve Christ. If you don't recognize the fact that mammon has a person, money has a personality, and if you don't seize it, if you don't take it by the neck, if you don't punch it out, it's not going to work. This past week, it was wonderful. We were traveling. Where were we traveling? Oh, boy, this is scary. Uh, we were traveling to pick up, oh, send my mother-in-law to the airport to send her off to Columbia. Uh, <laughs> we miss her. Uh, we do. So we drove her to, we're driving to uh, JFK, and we decided to stop by Starbucks at Exit 59 Ameri Parkway. And so we're in the line there, and I know, it's my little vice. So we're in line, and we're going to buy some, some Starbucks for the family, and I was really getting cheap. And, you know, I, what I, it's a little secret. Uh, what you do is you get a small and a medium cup. This is just a little trick for you. That way you get a medium for the price of small. All right, anyhow. So uh, <laughs> we're in the line there, and all of a sudden the, the lady goes, oh, someone paid your bill. I'm like, you're kidding me. Really? Yeah. Gee, I wish we ordered more stuff. We could have gotten more. <laughs> I would have got the pumpkin latte. I would have got a scone, breakfast sandwich. You know, the little Rice Krispies bars that has little calories, and yet it gives a lot of return. Anyhow, I, I, but we didn't do that. So I said, would you like to continue playing it forward? I said, yeah, why not? I'll pay for the next guy. Well, I wait, and I found out the next guy was cheaper than mine. So it was great. <laughs> but I walked away feeling good. Because I was sort of benevolent. <laughs> and I, I noticed this, that when I'm generous with other people, sometimes we go to restaurants, and I'll, I'll go there, and I'll see a couple, I can you see a, a single mom with her family, or the kids, and her friends or something. And there a couple of times what I've done is I cut, so the waitress, I said, do me a favor, would you please give me their, their check, and I'll pay it. You know, I just do it because I'm such an awesome guy. You know, I just, <laughs> I'm just kidding with you, okay? So, you know, you'll pay it, and then, you know, since I just tell them that God has their back. You know, I'll say a comment like that, and, and the person will smile and makes their day. I'm thinking, it cost me 30 bucks, which I don't do every day. It cost me $30 to make someone's day, and God only knows what else. You know, if you ever leave it, don't you ever. Let me, this gets me upset, because I used to be a waiter. One time I got, a, I got a, one of these religious people, you know, the people, the church people that are religious. They left me a tip. Here's your tip. Turn to Jesus or go to hell. There was, no, there was, there was, a, there was less than 15% of a tip. And I was like, man, it's a good thing I'm a believer because I would probably join uh, uh, the Satanist church after this one. Uh, if you leave a track, you better leave more than 20%. You know, that, that just not... And so, you know, if you want to be a witness to someone, be generous. It, and it, it makes you happy. It just does. It, it sounds... When I, when I give... It makes my wife worried. But it makes me happy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, just doing that and being generous. And it's important to take the God of mammon and punch it out. I know it sounds, that's what you got. You have to get violent with this thing. You can't play games with materialism. Because the moment you think you got it beat, it will get you. Always have to be vigilant. You always have to watch your back. Because let me tell you, the God of mammon is a bully. You hear about bullying? That's a bully. And how do you beat it? How do you break it? How do you overcome the God of mammon? How do you seize it and make it your servant instead of you serving it? I have some practical things on how we do that. First is this. The first thing I want to say is this. Followers of Jesus are given the high calling of using mammon without serving mammon. We must use mammon but not serve it. Well, how do you do that? Realize that God owns it, not you. I had the opportunity when I first became the pastor of this church 
uh, a dear, dear man. He's in the former church I was at, a wonderful man of God. He used to work for the Hartford. He's about 85 years old now, named Jim Castle. I'll say his name. One of the most wonderful, godly men I've ever met in my life. Just a tremendous man of God. Had such great wisdom. It was not about himself at all. It was about God. And uh, one time I, I said, yeah, uh, my church is Cornerstone. He said, excuse me? He looked at me. He says, he pointed at me in a, in a loving way. He says, no, Eric. That's not the church. That's the church you pastor. And don't ever forget it. Look me straight in the eye. And when he said that, it's like God spoke to me. And every time people say, they say, oh, it's your church. No, it's the church I pastor. It's not my church. Because if it's my church, all the stress is mine and everything else is mine. When it's God's church, he's got to take care of it. I just got to do what he has to say. Hey, God, you told me to do this thing, so hey. So it's good to understand that you have to surrender it over to God. And you have to understand how do you surrender? How do you slay? How do you make mammon your errand boy instead of you being its errand boy? We're going to talk a little bit more of that. We have to make a decision. Who's going to make our decisions, God or money? Let me ask you a question. If you're going to buy a house, what determines the house you get? Well, we can't afford that right now, so we can't buy that house. No, that sounds like a, a, a responsible and fiscal and wise thing to say. I remember being pre-approved when we first went, bought our first house. It was amazing what they pre-approved it for a half a million dollars. I'm thinking, oh, great, let's buy a half a million dollar house. There's no way we would have been able to sustain that. There's absolutely no way. But we had to live within our means. But the thing is, we have to determine who makes our decisions. The bank said, go ahead, buy a $500,000 house when you're a pastor of a church for two years. Go ahead and do that. There's no way I could do that. But, so, but the bank said I could do it, so I go ahead and do it. So what I have to ask myself the question is, God, do you want us to buy this house? Lord, what do you want us to do with it? Because this is not my money. This is your money. I am a steward. So you ask yourself the question. If uh, I remember when I first, you know, you first got, uh, first got my first job, and first thing I did when I got my first paycheck, guess what I did? I bought a car. <laughs> bought a car I couldn't afford. Uh, and it, it was a Ford, and that's why I couldn't afford it. <laughs> For, Ford's gotten better. All right. Found on road dead, fix or repair daily. Okay, let's continue on. Um, that was back in the old days. But, you know, I, just, I started buying things I couldn't afford. Why? And I didn't ask God. And I wanted to buy this car, but I didn't ask God. So what I did is I kept God at arm's length. I go to church, and, you know, I just say, okay, God, I'll, I'll have a little, my, my quiet times were shorter. And I tried to justify buying a car I could not afford. And so I basically lived for the car. It was so silly. Why? Because I didn't ask God. I wanted it. And so I kept God at bay. It's like a child that, you know, does something wrong. Hey, hey, Junior, what are you doing? Oh, hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. How are you doing? You know, they start, they start unloading the dishwasher and vacuuming. What is going on here? This is weird. Why? <laughs> Anyhow, you start trying to hide that. So the um, question is, if money determines what kind of house you buy, guess who's your God? Money. It sounds fiscally responsible, but you're asking money to do that. Um, if you determine what, for example, imagine, this is, this is really hard to imagine, so use your imagination a little bit this morning because this is a really hard one to picture. Imagine that in 2008, you heard the Lord say, time to build a church, and the stock market crashed, and everything went, everything went south. Imagine you were trying to build a church. And it, it wouldn't make, you know, it'd make a lot of sense. I'd say, you know what, 2008, 2009, this is a bad time for our country. Let's just take a break. Let's wait a while. Let's see how things go in the economy. Let's just play. Let's just hit cruise control at Cornerstone Church because we don't want to stress people out. People are stressed out enough as it is. And after all, the economy's bad. It's the wrong time to build. It's the wrong time to expand. Let's not do that right now. And so let's not. And imagine if we did that. We would have lost the opportunity. And I think what would have happened, we would have gone backwards because we wouldn't be walking in faith. We'd be walking in fear. And God would not be God, mammon would be God. How about this? Well, you know, if, if Sandra and I waited to have enough money to have children, we'd never have money. We'd never have children. They say each child, was, well, I can't remember which child cost you. It's extraordinary. I think it's about a million dollars now, each child. Something extraordinary. I can't afford to have a child right now. If I had to wait for that, 
But God said, start a family. And guess what? God meets us where we are. And look where you are now, uh, two and a, three years into the process. We're about ready to move in with le less than a month. Why? Because we heard God and we said, yeah, the money says don't do it, but God says do it. I'm not saying you're presumptuous and you make, take stupid risk, but if money controls your decisions, then money is your God. God must control your decisions. And by the way, and I know people use this all the time. God told me to do that. God told me to do that. God told me to do that. Well, I'm not talking about silly, manipulative words like that. I'm talking about having two or three witnesses, prophetic words, God confirming what he's told you through many wise counsel. That's when you know it's God. And it's something in your heart. And so that's another topic for another day. But if money determines what you do and you do not do, then God is your money. And God is not God. So how do we kill that? How do we break that? Anything you decide you will give your life to has power and can become a monster in your life. And so one of the ways you know if, you, if materialism has got you or if the God of mammon has you, if you cannot walk away from the things that you strive to get, if you can't walk away from your home, if you can't walk away from your house, if you can't walk away from your car, and if you feel like, mine, mine, then you know it's got you. But you say, you know what? It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. I like what John Wesley said one time. He was, he, he was uh, they, they said, your house burned. I said, oh, good. One last thing to worry about. <laughs> so if you're so connected to your possessions that, you know, of course you need to be good stewards, but it, you can't walk away from it. And another thing about this is sometimes people try to control by their giving. This is really insidious, insidious, because you're like, well, I'm going to be generous, but I'm going to control people with my generosity. Hey, I gave this amount of money. I should be here. Or I'm doing this. Well, let me give to this, and you can start controlling circumstances with that. And I, you know what? I see this happen a lot. This is very sad. Sometimes I see it in a, in a divorced couple where each, each one's trying to buy the children. You ever see that happen? You're trying to, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them this toy so they can like me more than this. The, my, my ex-spouse, or and you start playing that game, my friends, that's not giving. That's manipulation through giving. And it's, it's the God of mammon in giving. And you can do that as well. And, and this is another thing. If when I hear people say, I tried tithing and giving to God. It doesn't work. Uh, generally speaking, I say, well, you had the wrong attitude in giving. If you're giving to get from God, and you think he's going to give you $100,000 like you give it to $100 in a plate, you are living you're serving the God of mammon, not the God of uh, the Bible. Do you follow me? Does God bless us? Absolutely. But do I live for that? No, I live to obey God no matter what happens. Will he bless me? Absolutely. But don't misunderstand me, please, what I'm trying to say. I know a lot of times we sell God is if you're generous with God, he'll bless you. And, and we get crazy like a game show. A new car, you know, and the models are there and they're like this. No, that's not the way it is. That's not the way it is. We give because nothing is ours, and God promises to take care of us. It's like using somebody to get something out of them versus loving somebody because you love them. So that's all part of it. So what are some steps? How do we handle money? Well, one thing I want to say is this. One of the keys into being free of the God of mammon is this. You must care more about people than things. Care more about people than money. People should make your decision, not money. Sometimes, fiscally, it makes more sense to blow off people and not help people out. But you know what? You're better off doing the right thing for people. You're better off taking care of your family. I mean, my wife and I, and this, is, this is just our personal. Please don't take this as an indictment against anybody else here, please. This is just for us. But if we wanted to, I could send Sandra back full-time and we could have another sixty, seventy thousand dollars and we could buy a bigger house. You know what? I'd rather have time with my family. I'd rather have her home and work per diem. I, now, if you work two jobs, that's fine. Please understand. I'm just talking for us. All right? God speaks to each person. I do not put that something between you and God. But for us, we decided it's more important for us to have our family time. It's more important for us to do that. We decided to, you know, keep driving our cars longer. Why? We've got 150,000 miles in our car. Why? Well, when I was growing up, remember when I was, when I was growing up, once a car had 100,000 miles, it would blow up. The wheels would come off. <laughs> it just would. I mean, 100,000 miles. Get rid of it quick. It's going to explode. Nah. 
Especially if you had a Ford, uh, remember a Ford Pinto? You hit in the back, it blew up. How about a Yugo? Remember the Yugos? 45,000 miles. Get rid of it quick. Now cars, if you take care of them, they'll last, uh, they'll last 160 to 200,000 miles. It's amazing, right? And so why? And so we, we say, okay, what are we going to do? We, we want to live frugally. We want to live right. Now, I'm not saying if you buy a new car, you're bad. Please understand what I'm trying to say. You have to ask God what you should do. Don't in, superimpose what God told you on other people. Is that clear? That's religion, and we don't like that at all. And so we need to care about people more than money. We obey God and not money, even when it does not make sense. My family and I, when I was growing up in 1980, I know it's a long time ago, 1980, when Jimmy Carter was president of the United States, and we had, the, we had a kerosene uh, heater, and we had to wear sweaters because the oil prices were crazy. Uh, I remember my father was working at a church at the time. It was a Presbyterian church. Mainline, they take good care of you back in those days. And he had a pretty comfortable salary, and he was doing a good thing. But there things were going on in the church. My dad decided, I cannot in good conscience continue to work at this church doing, going against the Bible. I'm stepping out. I'm resigning. He had no job, period. In fact, my dad, at one time I was being a nosy me. I was kind of nosy. My, some guy came to our house about uh, 10 o'clock at night, and I was listening and talked to my father about getting a paper route. <laughs> my father getting a paper route to make money. And i never forget that we had this person, you might have heard the story before, but we had this person that was a, a widow, and she was poor, she had cancer, and we took care of her, brought her meals, we had her a house, and we took care of her, and all sorts of things. And I remember my parents having a conversation, said, Dave, we have no more money. And my dad said, we have to continue to trust God in our giving. And we're going, to take, we're, going to, we're going to tithe on what we have. We're going to tithe on the interest of what we have. And my parents made a decision to follow God. Now, they didn't follow God so they would get blessed off their socks. They followed God because they loved God. And you know what happened to us? This woman ended up dying. We had no idea. She left us $75,000. That's a lot of money back in 1980. And as a matter of fact, I wouldn't mind it right now. <laughs> if anyone wants to give you... Right, I'll put you on the board. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just playing with it. No, I'm not. Okay, okay. <laughs> all, all be told, we end up walking away with $125,000. My parents were able to buy a house. Later on, they sold the house for nearly $400,000. And God bless us. Why? We trusted him. We didn't do it to make money. We said, oh, we're going to serve God. We're going to trust God. My God will supply my needs. Money is not going to determine what I do. God will determine what I'm going to do. Well, well what are some steps to manage money well? First thing I want to mention is, is, and this is from practical things, I just feel I need to say some of these things because I found that common sense is not so common anymore. It's just not because our, our society is so backward. Uh, I told you last week, and I don't want to repeat myself, but I will because I can't help myself. <laughs> I mentioned to you last week, and I'll mention to you again, our country, if you were to personify our country's finances, it'd be like me making $50,000 a year with expenses that are $80,000 a year and having $200,000 on credit card. That's what our country's doing. That's irresponsible and unsustainable. So that's the God of mammon. My grandfather, he only bought stuff when he had the money. And there's, there's extremes out there. There are people, uh, well, first, before we get to that, keep track of your spending. If you don't know where your money's going, it's very, very easy. You know, you, you go to Starbucks, you go to Chipotle, you go to, you go to Dairy Queen. Ah, oh, it's only Dairy Queen. Also McDonald's, a dollar six for ice cream cone. And, and next thing you know, you start spending all this money, and then you, you look at the end of them, oh, my God goodness, we spent $400 on fast food in a month. No, we didn't do that, but I'm just imagining you did. But there's, you, you tally all these things up, oh, and, and, they, and you end up spending all this money. Why? You have no plan. Well, I don't know where my money goes. It just disappears. Yeah, you have to track it. You have to, you know, track the money. Where is it going? Otherwise, you know, oh, oh, it's Friday. I just got paid. I got a paycheck. And you just have a little swagger in your step. You walk into West Farms Mall. You go into Blooming, well, not Bloomingdale's. That's a Long Island. But you walk into Nordstrom's. And you walk, I'll have that. I'll have that. I'll have that. And you're feeling really good. And then the following week, by Tuesday, you're stressed out because you have no money left. 
you, so you got to track your money, know where it's going, and you'll be surprised to know. I mean, you add up, oh my goodness, I'm spending $800,000 on, on cable TV and my iPhone? <laughs> How many of you have seen that movie, Lego Movie? It's a great movie. The little, the little guy, they had this song called, Everything is Awesome. And he walks around and <laughs> everything is cool when you're part of the team. Everything is awesome. He's just walking around, these little things like this. He's walking around and, great. He goes, I have some coffee, please. That's $30. Great, I'll have that. And he's walking around. He's having a good old time. And he's, he's, <laughs> That's how our society is. We're just spending money we don't have. Everything is not awesome if you do that. You'll be in big, big trouble got to keep track of your spending. You know, I sometimes get crazy. Okay, the, the, uh, okay, this is soap. This is soap category. Uh, there, you know, just, okay, we have, dom we have domestic expenses such as like how to, you know, uh, grass seed and dish laundry soap and uh, there's rent, there's car, there's utilities. You follow those things and then you say, how much we have left at the end of the month? Well, we only have about $50. Now, this is what I have found. If you get out of college, and your parents give you money when you're in college. At the end of the week, you have $50, okay? You get your first job. You're making $45,000 a year plus benefits, and what do you have at the end of the week? $50. <laughs> and you get a pay raise. You become a CEO. You're making $450,000. What do you have at the end of the week? $50. <laughs> and so what you notice is uh, that this happens, that whatever you start, you continue on. So you got to start small and manage it well now so when you have more later, you won't have more later if you don't manage it well now. All right? And so you need to keep track of your money, whatever you need to do. My friends, our government doesn't do that. We need to do that. Why? Because if you're in debt and you are so stretched out and don't know what's going, you can't be generous to people. You can't write someone a $30 check to bless someone at a restaurant. You can't help an a, 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 a orphan. You cannot help get to missions. You cannot do various things. You're stuck. You're stuck. So that's the first thing. Keep track of your spending. Number two is this. And the Bible says uh, in, in Proverbs 27, 23. 27, 23. Be sure to know the condition of your flocks. Give special attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever. Uh, have you guys noticed that? Yeah, okay. Number two, I'll go a little faster. Plan ahead. And the Bible says make sure you ask the Lord first. But still, we need to plan ahead. We need to look ahead. The Bible says the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. That's Proverbs 21.5. A lot of great stuff about money in Proverbs. The plans of the diligent lead to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. Make plans for your financial future. Now, we're not, you know, this is hard. This is what I've been told, and it really does work. If you're able to do this, if you're able to tithe 10% and save 10% and live on 80%, that's a kind of good way to start your life. I can't do that. Then we have to, there has to be some margins in your life. If there's no margin in your life, what happens if the car breaks down? Then you have to use a credit card. Well, it's 0% interest for a year. Yeah, and then the laundry machine breaks down. Oh, it's 0% for another year. <laughs> and you get all these 0% cards, and, and then a year goes by, now it jumps up to 25%. Well, I'll just pay the minimum balance in each of them. You pay the minimum balance on $8,000, you know what? It, I know how long it will take you to pay that off? About 30 years. That's insane. Okay, the worst, I'm just telling you, the worst kind of, don't, never, don't take loans from credit cards. It's not smart. I mean, just, and cr if you can't pay your credit card, then don't use it. I mean, I'm a big, I'm a firm believer, this is kind of a old joke, but I'm a firm believer in plastic surgery. Get out the kicker, and if you cannot control, listen, there's two extremes out there. There's one extreme says, have no debt whatsoever, it's of the devil. And there's other people says this, oh, you need to use it to, as leverage to marginal, and which one's right? That's between you and God, but extremes are not good. And I, you know, I think it's important that we understand the Bible says in Proverbs, the rich rules over the poor, Proverbs 22, 7, and the borrower is a servant to the lender. You know, I, you're going to have a, you're going to have Ford or GM or Chrysler own you because your car payment? Are you going to live in a house that you, you can't afford? It's not worth it, man. You, you're like a slave to that thing. You're better off. So should you get out of debt? I, yeah, debt is, I personally, I shouldn't give my personal opinion, but I will because I, I can. Um, I think sometimes maybe a house payment might be all right, but I don't think getting, getting, a, getting debt over everything, 
uh, buying couches and refrigerators and iPods and, and all this other golf clubs and, and going to debt. It's just not wise, folks. If you don't have the money, don't buy it. it just don't do it. Some, sometimes you start a business and you, you need some capital to start, and it makes sense to do that. But it's like wine, for example. I'm going to get myself in trouble. I'm going all these bad areas. And some people say that wine's of the devil. You should not drink at all. Listen, I don't, you know, and they say that wine's evil. Do not drink. Well, Jesus drank wine, okay? He says, do not be drunk with wine. There's people that says, do not go into debt at all. It, uh, the, the, uh, the, the borrower is a servant to the lender. Don't, that's, that's of the devil. Well, there's extremes. There are certain people that cannot handle debt at all. They cannot handle taking loans out. They, they, ha they have no control. Those folks get rid of debt completely. There's some folks that have the ability to control it. Again, it's between you and God. But I will tell you, debt will kill you. And when you go to buy a car and the salesman says, here's your investment. <laughs> it's not an investment. As soon as you pull off the lot, you lose a lot of money. And listen, I, I'm, I'm preaching to myself here. <clears throat> Unless you buy a classic muscle car with matching numbers at Barry Jackson. Okay, but anyhow... You eliminate, get rid of excessive debt. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. Don't buy it. Live within your means. Wise up about your lifestyle. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 45, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have wisdom and show restraint. Uh, if, if your friends are going to Disney World and going on vacation and spending $8,000, it doesn't mean you take a home, a home equity loan and go on vacation. Can I just say something to you? That's stupid. I'm just telling you, it's stupid. Don't do that. Because now you're paying, well, I'm, I'm giving abuse to my children. No, you're not abusing your children. Go to Kwasi. They have the wooden warrior. Or wait for the church picnic. <laughs> it's not worth it to go into debt over vacation and you're paying it off and you're stressed out and, and, you're, and you and your spouse or whatever, you're in so much stress and I got to pay. Uh, this is another one that gets me, okay? And I got to be honest with you here. If you're going to be a youth pastor, don't go to school and rack up $225,000 of debt. It's just not smart. You're going to make about $30,000 out of the box. And you have $225,000 on you? How are you supposed to minister with that kind of stress? I mean, I, I'm all for Ivy Leagues and these, these great schools, and I, they're fantastic. If you're going to be a lawyer or a doctor, okay, you'll get your money back. But if you're going to be a school teacher, why on earth are you going to have a $200,000 debt? It's not wise. Now, if mom and dad can pay for it, go, go for it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but God, be responsible. Don't get into debt. I mean, my, my dad, I, my, my parents are amazing. You know, my dad worked three jobs and went to college and, and, and dated my mother and graduated with a master's degree without debt. I mean, he worked his tail off if he had to do it. Okay? And so, my friends, I'm telling you, education is a wonderful thing, and it, we will pay about it. Be responsible about it. Please, I'm telling you, I'm not saying not, don't go to college because you'll make your money back, but how many folks have noticed that education is getting out of, out of control here? Look at the vocation you're doing and see, be realistic. As a youth pastor, you're not going to make $200,000 to pay it off. Even doctors are struggling to pay off their, their bills. We have friends of ours that are, that are doctors now. They're making, you know, they're making the real money now, and they're still paying off their debt. It, it's, it's hard, so be careful with that. I, I'm okay. Living within your means... I'm preaching. I'm getting my soapbox because I can. Okay. We wise up about money. Seek moderation. And this is another one. Give habitually. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled with overflowing and your vats will brim with new grape juice. I'm sorry, new wine. By the way, I'm not a drinker. I'm just using that as an example. Proverbs 11, 24, 25 says, One man gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds on jewelry and becomes the poverty. A generous man will prosper. He, refuses, he who refuses others will himself be, ref I'm sorry, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And so I just want to mention to you, I like what John Wesley said, the great church reformer said the following. He started a Methodist church, which was a, and a out of birth of a revival. It says, gain all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Guys, listen. 
let's kill this God of mammon. Let's take it by the throat. Let's kill it. Let's take control of it. Let us control money by God's spirit and not let the spirit of mammon control us. Let us be a people that live responsibly. Let us be people that are not so in debt we can't help anyone else out. I believe God wants us to be an example to the world that's going to be struggling. I think God wants us to be, uh, I think God wants us to generate wealth so we can help our other people out. But we've got to be very careful because just the moment you think you've, you've looked at it, it's right at you. Never forget that the God of mammon is a demon, he's a bully. And no matter how, if you think you've overcome it, you have not overcome it. Always, let me say it again, always watch the God of mammon. He's deceitful. Always give the money to God. This is your money, not mine. Live within your means and be generous and watch what God will do. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I, I know that uh, controversial topic and Lord, I know it's not about that. And so, Father, I just pray right now, this morning, God, that we would choose this day that we will not serve the God of Mammon. Lord, we reject, we love America, we love being in this country, but we reject the economic system of America right now. We reject uh, this debt mentality. We reject play and pay. Instead, we embrace, we, we embrace pay and then play. Father, we, we embrace delayed gratification. God, we choose to put you at the center of our lives. We choose to say that it's not our money, it's your money, and we are stewards. Father, we ask that we would never forget that money has a spirit upon it. Lord, we want the money that's in our hands or in our possession to be your money and not the God of man. Father, we choose to serve you we choose to prosper by living in you, Father. Prosper, prosperity is a state of mind, not a state of a bank account. And Father, we choose this day to honor you with everything we have in Jesus' name. And I'm going to ask you a question. I ask it every single week. Who is the boss of your life? I believe in Jesus. So what? Is Jesus number one in your life? Do you make your own decisions or does God make your decisions for you? If you've not surrendered your life, I don't care how much you believe in Christ, I don't care how much you tithe or give, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you're only an intellectual follower. You're not a believer in Jesus. You're not, you're not part of the family unless you give your life to Christ. And if you've prayed this, the quote-unquote sinner's prayer, Lord, come into my life, da 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 if you say it and you have not given your life to Christ, you've not surrendered your life to Him and said, you're the boss, if you're holding back a margin for yourself to be in control, you're probably not even a believer. And I mentioned it last week. I'll mention it all the time. Every day I kick God out of the chair. I, I, I say, God, get out of the campus here. I'm in charge. Oops, I'm sorry, God. Get back in. It's a struggle, but I always put God back in. If God's not in there, you're not a believer. I'm just telling you. And so if you'd like to give your life to Jesus today, we can do that right now. So I'm going to pray right now a prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I know you are God. Jesus, I know you died on the cross. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you paid for all of my sins. And I also believe you rose again from the dead. I choose this day, by your help, to give my life to you. I declare this morning that you are the boss. You're the master. You're the commander of my life. You're the chief. You're the CEO of my life. I will submit my life to your way. I reject being the boss myself. And I say that I will follow you with your help. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.